At least I think it has been a wonderful experience because I can only remember little bits of it. <laughs> so can I just check out who is here today? I understand that there are a number of social pedagogues here today. Can I just see who are the social pedagogues? No. <laughs> okay. Do we have one? Yes. Okay, you're very welcome. Uh, do we have any teachers here? Master Excellent, excellent. You're very welcome. Do we have any psychologists who are lurking in the audience? Who have I missed out? We have a psychiatrist? Yes. Yeah, excellent. How many? One? You two are welcome. Thank you. So, can I say welcome to everyone? Occupational therapist. Occupational therapist. Excellent. Thank you. So, Excellent. You are very welcome. So, today uh, I want to share with you some work which I've been doing for the past seven years. With the carers, the residential carers, and the foster carers, and the adoptive parents of children who have been rejected, neglected, and abused. Thank you. But first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself 
and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my partner who is part of this project and then I'm going to tell you about the project. So this is the front of University College London. Uh, it is the largest college in the University of London. Uh, University of is It has uh, twenty-eight thousand undergraduates. Mass machine chapter twenty eight thousand and twelve thousand postgraduates. Uh over tra Akasi student the student and that probably Akasi uh Master School and Power. One quarter of all of the students at the University College are from overseas. University College London is uh, about 250 years old and it is a very interesting university because it was the first university in England to admit students irrespective of their religion or their race or their gender. The Department of Psychology is 110 years old. It is the second oldest uh, Department of Psychology in the world. You will probably know that the first one, oldest one, was at the University of Leipzig. I have put up this picture because the bicycle on the right hand side is my bicycle. <laughs> I live uh, in a very attractive city which is about uh, 90 kilometers south of London. Uh, so every morning I catch a train at 6.18 and I travel to London. I take my bike on the train and I cycle from the London station to University College. It takes me 12 minutes. And I have only fallen off my bicycle on one occasion. <laughs> on the other hand, this is my business partner. We are, we are in Berlin when this photograph is taken. His name is Colin McGinn. He is a very wealthy man and he, he collects uh, BMW cars. Oh. When we were in Berlin, he met a salesman <coughs> who told him this is the very latest BMW car, so he bought it. <laughs> so 
I have shown you a photograph of uh, University College London, and it's a very grand university, and it's a, it, uh, it, is a, uh, it stretches over a one quarter of a square mile in the middle of London, in the centre of London. Uh, Um, the best thing that we can talk about uh, London is the uh, University College that is studying the Zanu Sadegi data set in Europe. It's a uh, uh, hectares at most that's more in charge. Uh, however, uh, uh, the, the place where the applied psychology came was from the, one of these children's homes which my partner Colin McGinn owned. He owned three London children's homes. <laughs> so I brought the psychology from University College London, but he brought the practice from his work in the children's homes that he owned. It was a marriage which was made in heaven, and I will tell you about it. So this is what I'd like to do. I would like to first of all give you some of the background to the kind of children and young people that we're going to be talking about. Then I want to tell you about the new approach, the new model of professional child care that we are uh, operating with the people who look after the children. So, unusually, the focus of our work is not with the children, the focus of our work is with the people who look after the children. I'm then going to tell you about the three the elements of the sales. The elements uh, are Many there are the other elements. Some elements are sales, the element of the Meeting the child's parenting needs. Helping the, the children and young people to deal with the emotional trauma which they have. Experienced. They have been abused by their parents, sexually and physically, maybe. They have been neglected by their parents, or and they have been rejected by their parents. And then the third element of all of this is We want to uncover some of their what are called signature strengths, character strengths, and help them to use these strengths more effectively in their lives. Okay. So the uh, and then I'd like to try uh, to try and get some information of, uh, uh, from people in the audience here about the way in which they try to help either parents or foster parents or residential carers or adopted parents with the children and young people in their care. Yeah. Okay. So let me introduce you to just one of the children uh, that we know of, uh, because if I can sketch out the background of this young person, I think we call him Daniel. We call him Daniel. Uh, if I can sketch out the background, 
perhaps you will realize that children in, who have had the experiences that he has had really need help desperately and they need it over a long period of time. Uh, now Daniel is a black child, but uh, the children, of course, who are taken away from their parents are black, white, they are from all sorts of different cultures, uh, they are male, they are female, they are just the complete cross-section of the population. So Daniel uh, was not physically abused by his parents, he was not sexually abused by his parents, he wasn't even really neglected by his parents, but he was his parents were part of a yardy gang and he saw lots of violence. Daniel has seen more violence than we have seen on late night television. He has seen people being killed, he's seen people being tortured, and his, uh, as a result of this, his view of life and the way he treats he thinks of himself and the way he treats other people is very different and very alien from most uh, 14-year-olds. Um, Daniel has many problems. One of them is he is a supporter of the English football club Chelsea. So, what happens to these children? Well, well, one of the things that happens to them is, within our educational system, they fail miserably. I've given you some of the data there, uh, on, uh, which has occurred over a period of time uh, in our education system. And, and what is happening is that most children are, uh, the percentage of children is increasing slowly each year. The percentage of children who are taken into care, their educational attainments are also attaining uh, are also increasing over over time, but they start off at such a low baseline that uh, they are still far behind the achievements and attainments of children who are not in public care. In I have no idea of the percentage of, of uh, young people who go to educate, who go to universities 
or higher education within uh, Georgia. Does anyone else here know who, in 2012 roughly what percentage of the population will end up in a university or higher education establishment? Actually, in general, we don't know statistics, statistics about who is, uh, if they are not planning to attend university, but if they are willing to uh, attend the university, we have statistics about it. Like, uh, out of uh, only 10 or 8% uh, of children who are willing to continue their study at the university fail at the entry exam. Uh, okay, I understand. The first person was the uh, village doctor. He had, he had uh, gone to university and he came back to work in the village uh, and uh, he was the very first. I was the second and the third one was a, a person who studied engineers, engineer, engineering and he eventually became head of the electricity board in Ireland. Now, when I go back to my the village where near where I was born, I would find it difficult to find a house where at least one person hadn't been to university. I would have to search very hard to find uh, a house where at least one member of the family hadn't actually so from 6% uh, in 1967 through to 43% in 2012 is a gigantic success. Uh, how many, what is the percentage, do you think, 
of children who have been taken away from their parents and been looked after by the state, what do you think is the percentage of children who are looked after by the state who go to university or to higher education? Is what do you think? <laughs> Procentual machines will be in the same Very low. Quite, yes. How low? Two percent. Two percent. You have a genius. Can you say Two percent. Now, that has improved because in 2007, the central government spent a large amount of money in schools making them more friendly and supportive of these particular children. So, as a result, what's the percentage now? Yeah, I got just about to say yeah. <laughs> Two. Yeah. Two. Can I say also, in, two, in 2007, the percentage of children going to, uh, in care, going to university was 1%. The government then for five, six years spent a huge amount of money, mega, mega money, and now it has gone up to 2%. But it's a long way away from 43%, isn't it? So the latest figures suggest that about 4% of the children looked after go to university but only 2% of them stay there. Okay, so I, don't, I hope you can translate this as a very powerful statement. Uh, for some children, even before they are conceived, and certainly before they are born, the so they are the they are the children who before they are often before they're conceived or before they're born, all of the cards are stacked against them. Because not going to university and not doing well within the public exam system is only a small part of the problems that these children and young people experience. Many people here who are reading psychology will be familiar with the Maslow hierarchy. Maslow's hierarchy is the pyramid of growth. This is the pyramid of despair. Maslow's So what happens to these children is they suffer adverse experiences. Uh, in their early life. Such experiences affect all areas of their development. How they think, their cognitive development, their language, their emotional development. It affects every single aspect of their development. As a result of this, when they get to adolescence, 
they often indulge in very high risk behaviors, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, prostitution, criminal acts. Uh, such a lifestyle leads to them contracting all sorts of diseases, HIV, AIDS, for example, uh, tuberculosis. Uh, they, uh, they are overrepresented in the mental health problem area. And 23% of the prison population under 25 have had some contact with the care system. So many, not all, but many end up homeless, jobless, friendless, and incarcerated. And many die here. These are probably the most vulnerable group of children in our society today. In uh, the UK, there are 70,000, a, a little over 70,000 of these children uh, in the UK today. 17 or 17? 17. 17. Oh, so I want to ask you another question. Do you have children like this in Georgia? So I think if you do, and if you had experience of such children, I think you'll agree when I say they are among the most vulnerable children and young people in our society. So how do we go about helping children who have had such adverse early experiences and who, as a result of which have got such complex problems? In, uh, in the UK, many of these children, particularly those with complex problems, will be receiving individual therapy. The, the problem is, if you are dealing with very difficult issues, as a, an adult, you find it quite hard to, conti to continue therapy. Children and young people who don't have the experience of adults find it really difficult, really difficult indeed, as a result of which they are, they, it is very difficult to get them to go to, to the therapeutic section. So seven years ago, Colin McGain, the man who owns the BMW Trevi, and I, uh, uh, we decided that we would want to try a, di a different approach. And we thought rather than uh, investing our, all our time in help and dealing individually with the children, we would try and help the people who spent time with them 24 hours a day, we would try and help them to do some of the clever things that 
that uh, particularly therapists can do. So it's a bit of a challenge this, isn't it? Because with the children and young people need help now. We don't have five, seven, eight years to train them. We need to be able to help them from the very beginning. And we need to find very simple ways of helping them to understand the complex behavior of, ch of ch the children and to help them to uh, manage this behavior, to help the children. So the question becomes, how do we break into that, that vicious circle? How do we try to reverse a spiral which gets tighter and tighter and tighter until the options for the child are reduced to almost zero? So before I tell you how we went about doing this and allowing you to think or to evaluate what we've done, are there any questions that anyone would like to ask at the present moment? Or are there any contributions that anyone here would like to make about what I've been saying so far? Actually, uh, I would like you to get clarification with regard of the types of uh, child care. What have you got in Great Britain? In Georgia, we have child care which is tried to be more uh, resembling the family type of situation, and also we have the uh, children's houses. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a variety. Um, the first thing is that uh, some of these children are looked after by relatives, by grandparents, or by sometimes an, an aunt or an uncle, sometimes by, uh, even by a neighbor who has been particularly interested in for these children, for these uh, parents who are looking after the children, who are acting as parents, there is a, a minimum of support. So maybe a social worker will visit three or four times a year and spend 10 or 15 minutes with the family and say, to say, everything okay, how are things, how are you getting on? A small, man, a small number are also looked after by their parents who are, who are supported by a social worker and who may also have to go off to learn how to be better parents at parenting classes. Most of the children, about 80%, are 
foster. Uh, and uh, the foster parents are paid by the state uh, for this service. A, a minority, maybe 10, 12 percent, are in very small children's homes, four to six children. So the, the photograph of the two children's homes of London, there are two houses uh, which are put together, uh, there were six children staying there, three and one, three and side, three and the other. For, uh, for people working in local, local government and control, people who control finances, residential care is very, very expensive. But for some children, of course, it's the only option. I should also mention before I forget, most of the different counties or big cities in, in, in England and Wales will have one or maybe two secure units for uh, children and young people. These are units where the children are enclosed in a, in a large area, may, uh, several hectares, but it is a, it's a form of imprisonment. So, and we are working on all of these. We are working in, we're working with foster carers, we're working with adoptive parents, we're working, we're working with residential carers, and we actually work in two of these secure rooms. <coughs> and these the secure units are 16 people, 16 in each, and these are for children who really are so out of control that no one can control them, or they've committed serious criminal offences. Does that help? Uh, the age of residence, till what age do you provide the residential care? Until at least 18, minimum. Minimum has been to London. The question is about how, what about those children's transitions? How frequently do they need to change over the placement and move from one type of care to another type of care? Yes, uh, that's a good question. I think actually far. Okay. Uh, the main objective of a children's home is to help to get the child to a level of adjustment where they can go to a foster home. And for some children, who perhaps have been to one or two or even three different foster homes and they've broken down, of course, a residential placement may be the only option. 
در این باشه بیشه جامعه تور، سام، پوستر و جفتن یکنین در از نایت دای کارا فیلمتی از دوارم ما از تی رزیدنت و تی بیس باشه سخلیه تر کنم سواری پوست If you are sitting here thinking about the 32 children that we work with, pure and secure units, uh, it's probably just important for me to give you a, a different perspective of these children. The two units we work in uh, uh, are inspected regularly and they are rated outstanding. And they are outstanding. The, the help and support for the children within these two units is exemplary. The relationships with the staff are exemplary. The way in which the children grow and develop, educationally, socially, emotionally, is very gratifying. I perspective of the the در شده که بیش خندخ مرد مرد هست هره چهار بود بود چیه تا با تنم شانه کن قدر چیز ده بیان بیتر ده بیان رو بود قانه کلیس بیو ایس سوچیاویت ایموچیوریست میخدید هست So when I first went to visit these I thought what a dreadful idea to have to stop to, to, to keep children in a very small area when I left I spent a whole day when I left I thought What an amazing job these these units are doing. So sometimes as professionals we have to overcome some of our personal prejudices like I have to. Okay, so can I go on now and tell you a little bit about what we've done? The, here's the model of professional child care that we, we are helping people to use with children who have got very complex needs. And uh, Nina or Nina, can you tell me five minutes before we stop? Okay. Give, me a, give me a warning. <laughs> Because this is not a mix topic. So, okay, so can I, I will tell you a little bit about the model and then I should think by then it's probably time for a cup of coffee, but let's see. <laughs> So, there are 170,000 carers, teachers, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, aides of all types involved in these particular children. There are 70,000 uh, 70, children, but there are 170,000 people looking after them. So it doesn't take the math math mathematicians in the audience to to think two thoughts. Number one, well, that's an awful lot of people. And number two, wouldn't it be great if we could get those people to do the kind of things, the activities, to provide the support for these children that they actually need? What a powerful workforce. <laughs> Rauchende Sori Azri. Ramchela Raudenovis Adamian 
تجاری از چرخونی هم سک بشی هم باشه ایل برام ایسه ایو این کام و غیلی بول رو مرتوات که اگه تسیست هست هم باشو سه سه چی بگم which is part of our new way of looking. Not only can we say there's an awful lot of people looking after them and we should perhaps be working with them, but what we also have to look at is something which, which very, very few people realize. I don't know whether uh, in Croatia, uh, uh, in Georgia, in Georgia, I don't know whether in Georgia you have a newspaper which uh, is uh, meant for people who uh, only who only have a short period of time to read. Uh, and uh, who the, the headlines are always shock, horror, and on page three there is a, usually a lady with wearing very few clothes. Do you have these <laughs> Do you have these papers? Oh, you do. Of course, of course, yes. Papers like this say, these are children from another planet. These are children who are feral children. Do you know the word feral? Feral, feral is like a uh, wild. <laughs> For example, in uh, Annika, there are lots of feral dogs. Do you understand? Ah, uh, uh, not unknown dogs. <laughs> they say these children should be kept away from society because they are dangerous and they are different. The, the truth, the truth is the very opposite. These children are there not because of what they have done, but because of what their parents have done. So, logistically, we should be helping the carers of such children and young people. But ethically, we should be helping these children because most of them are there through no fault of their own. So we should be asking ourselves, what is it that's going on that is causing these children to be so resistant to education, to have such emotional problems and difficulties? We're missing something very important. I don't know if you can read the caption. Can you read the caption or not? Um, oh, so the caption. 
ոչ կարգած մուարտի մագրամ վերգավատ եր աղթեպա So, so just like the donut of a, a shop owner, we must be missing something really big. And that's what I'd like to uh, move on to talk about now. In my office uh, at University College London, I have this pinned up in a great big notice, and my objective is each day that I try to give somebody a slightly different perspective on something they think they know everything about. So for the psychologists in the audience, you should make this a major objective. Can I just say that uh, this uh, is taken from a book which Paul Valeri wrote in 1943. 1943 was a vintage year. <coughs> it was an outstanding year. It is the year that I was born. <laughs> so why should we turn to psychology as a way of trying to understand the needs of these children, trying to help people to uh, use these children, to support these children better than they already do. And the short answer is because it is a phenomenally powerful agent for bringing about positive change. We have three children and I wanted all of them to read psychology. So any chance I got, I would say there is this wonderful subject, it's psychology. You, when you get a chance to go to university, it's the best possible choice you can make. Unfortunately, by doing this, by stressing how good it was to young people in who are 17, 18, 19 years old, none of our children chose to read psychology. <laughs> Uh, 
Սեցոլաս ու անխործի էլ է դիում ես արի իսրացունը տայիկի խոտ շետիկատ արձեք մեն չէ նոր չումը առայի չի եմ ծիկոլոգիում։ Why is this? Because I violated one of the best known pieces of research about getting adolescents to change and that is for an adult to say this is really good. What I should have said is there is a subject called psychology. If I hear of any of you children wanting to read this particular subject, then in, when I make my will, you will get 10 Lara only. Larry only. <laughs> So the part of psychology is not only that it uh, deals with human issues, but it's also evidence-based. There's also some evidence to say this is a better way of getting children to change than this way. Um, Okay. So here we go. I wanted a I wanted a big picture that I could tell the residential carers and the foster parents who had not been through university, who had not been through professional training, I wanted a, a way of being able to help them to understand why the children were be behaved in the way that they do. Um, can I ask how many people here have heard of either Ronald Romer or who have heard of his parent acceptance rejection theory? <coughs> Thank you. That's very impressive. When I ask a, a UK audience, a, a British audience, no one puts their hand up. So the fact that three people put their hands up is very impressive. I'm impressed. <laughs> Ronald Rohner has a large uh, research. Uh, team. They have carried out research all over the world. Yeah. All sorts of different cultures. Different races, different <laughs> geographical areas. Two years ago, Ronald Rohner was awarded the American Psychology Association's gold medal for distinguished contributions to child psychology. So here's the in, a, in summary, here is Rohner's view of what has happened. He says the big factor in all of this area is the factor, in our case, of parental rejection. Uh, 
He says, all the evidence that he has gathered says, children and young people need parental acceptance and they need parental rejection like they need a hole in the head. So, although the behavior which indicates parental acceptance may vary from culture to culture, there's a 100% agreement on the difference between parental acceptance behavior and parental rejection behavior. So, interestingly enough, he says, rejection can be very <coughs> obvious to everyone. So the social worker visits and says, this children, this child is being seriously damaged in this family. Perhaps there's drug abuse or alcohol abuse or perhaps the child is being sexually abused. Sometimes parental rejection is obvious. But sometimes it is subtle. Sometimes it is because a child may perceive my mother, my father think more of me than my sister. If the child's need for parental acceptance is not met, then all sorts of problems occur. And the problem's behavior, the problem behavior that you notice is children are withdrawn. They indulge in very vindictive behavior. So they say cruel things to the people who are looking after them, or they say cruel things to their peers. Or they are very violent. They have violent outbursts, which are difficult to manage. They have violent, they exhibit violent behavior. This sort of behavior you find in among looked after children really frequently. You see it in children's homes all the time. And when it occurs in foster homes, the foster parents can, can uh, adapt to this behavior for so long, and then they say, enough, I can't take any more. These uh, behavior problems, these emotional difficulties, they persist, they just don't go away. Now, Ronald Rohner is not naive. He knows that there are other factors involved uh, as well as parental rejection. Uh, Ronald 
He knows, for example, that bad parenting or dysfunctional parenting can be associated with, uh, say, for example, poverty. However, the vast majority of people who live either up or below the red line, they have very little money, the vast majority of people do not neglect or abuse or reject their children. So there are other factors, but what he is claiming is parental rejection is the biggest circus in time. So these are just some of the behaviours that result from uh, parental rejection. Now I have taken about 10 minutes with an interpreter to describe parental rejection to you. I hope that you understand it. What I can say is that it is the sort of uh, theory which may simplify that what's going on with these particular children, but what it can do is it can help uh, carers and foster parents and, and other people who don't have uh, experience, let's say for example of uh, social care or uh, social work or psychiatry or psychology, it can help th them to understand why these children are behaving the way they do. So that is our big starting point. That's like the umbrella under which we're going to build uh, a, a new way of helping significant adults to help these children. So the second thing which we want to look at is what is the process by which good parental behaviour occurs? And we've taken two well-developed areas of psychology and psychiatry they're, they're well evidenced, and uh, we've said that there is a process which leads to the child feeling good about themselves, feeling comfortable about themselves, having a good level of empathy, having a good level of self-worth. It doesn't just happen, it's the experiences that the child has uh, in the, the early years of his life particularly, which lead to these good outcomes. And the first of these is the process of attunement which leads to secure attachment. So attunement is the way that the carer, mother or the father or the grandfather or the grandmother, the person taking after the child, adjusts their behaviour to let the child see at the very end, from the, almost from the moment they're born, that they understand the child's needs, the child's feelings, that they can help them to soothe the child. All of these are things that uh, good, good parents do. Uh, 
Uh, I'm lucky enough to be a grandfather. I have, I have uh, three grandchildren. What a step grandchild who is uh, 13 years old. Her name is Matilda. Tilly. I have a three and a half year old grandson. His name is Arthur. Uh, Arthur, something I have And I have a nine-month-old grandson who, <coughs> whose name is Alec. That's Fratis Alec I watch my daughter and uh, and uh, Alec together. Now, uh, now, uh, <laughs> now I I also am amazed at what goes on between them because. Helen, our daughter, understands everything that's going on inside Alex's head. I say to Helen, Helen, you speak perfect Alex ease. I speak, I speak pigeon allergies. I understand some of the things that, uh, some of the emotions, some of his non-verbal behaviour. But Helen speaks perfect Arthur Ames. So the whole area of learning to speak Alec Eves is part of that achievement process. Alec is a lucky, lucky boy. Yes. And one of the reasons why I have worked in this area for the last seven years is I want the children who have been taken into care to experience one fiftieth of what my grandson Ali gets from his mother. One fiftieth is enough. Not even 25%, not 50%. Two percent is enough. So here's what happens when you don't get what Alec is getting. When you, your parent is unable to soothe you, to meet your needs, to understand what type of your feelings, to know when you're upset, to know when you're crying because you're just bored as opposed to crying when you're hurting. Here's what, here's what happens when you don't get these things. And the answer is you end up with children who are incredibly self-centered. Me, 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 I, I, I. You end up with children who cannot read the emotions of other people. You end up with children who have either very, very low self-esteem uh, or they have, they have a, a non-realistic sense of self-esteem. So they say, I'm not going to school, school is boring, I'm going to be a rock star, I'm going to earn 150,000 uh, lari every week. <coughs> they have low frustration tolerance. Some small thing will send them into a huge temper.
and they're not very e they can't regulate their uh, moods very easily. These are the children who know two feelings only. They can express two feelings only. One is, this is going to be difficult, one is, that is crap or that is cool. That is good or that is bad. If I, ask, <coughs> if I ask people in this audience but to look at, uh, for example, a video, they can identify 40, 50 different emotions. These children can identify two. So I'm going to leave you with that particular quotation. The quotation is, it is, it is possible to love a child passionately but not in the way that they need to be loved. So many of the people who have got alcohol abuse problems or drug abuse problems, they love their child dearly. Unfortunately, what they're doing is they're actually damaging their child. So let's just summarize and then let's go for a cup of coffee. Here are, here are the things I've said. We are dealing with a group of children who are perhaps the most vulnerable in our society today. Many things have been tried to help such children and failed. The question we ask is, can psychology do any better? So let's start with a big theory which seems to indicate exactly what is wrong with these child children. That's the parental acceptance rejection theory. And then let's look at one aspect of good parenting, which is attunement leading to the child feeling securely attached. So after playtime, we will uh, continue the story.